Now last week, we saw God preparing to open the door of his church to Gentiles through Cornelius, a devout, praying man who feared God, lived for God, but did not know Jesus Christ, <coughs> brought to the truth by sending uh, for Peter as called for by the angel. Showing his desire for truth, Cornelius immediately sent for a Jew as a carnally su uh, superior Roman. He's a centurion. He's got lots of power over a conquered people. And yet he called for this Jew because he recognized he needed to hear the truth about the Jewish God from this Peter. And that provided him salvation. We saw the visions, the timing, the seeming coincidence of God giving Peter the proper sword to use in unfamiliar territory. Showing by the vision of, of the unclean animals coming down. Peter being hungry. God telling him, rise, kill, and eat. I provide you food. Peter says, not so, Lord. I have never eaten anything unclean. And then uh, uh, God did the same vision three times, telling him, what I have called clean, call thou not common. So this gave him the understanding that Gentiles were going to be accepted. And right then, in the middle of this, he was told, you got three Gentiles waiting for you. Go answer the door. Which Peter then did. He was now ready to use the very last key that he was given. The keys to the kingdom, given in Matthew uh, 16, 19. Now there's a lot of confusion about the keys given to uh, Peter. The Catholics will say that uh, the keys are given to Peter, and every one of us must go to Peter, because he's got the key of the kingdom, and if we don't listen to Peter, we can't enter. But the Bible says Jesus, not Peter, is the judge of the quick and the dead. The keys were only given to open the doors to a certain bar of people, to bring people in, in a controlled way, to build upon the foundation. He opened the door to the Jews at, uh, at uh, Pentecost. He opened the door to the Samaritan in Acts chapter 8, and now he's about to use his very last key. Now think of it this way. At 6 o'clock this morning, these church doors were locked. There's no one coming in. Jerry had the keys to the kingdom here. When Jerry came and opened the door, people could walk in. How many of you had to see Jerry before you walked into the church? <laughs> he had one job. His job was to open the door. And once he opened the door, everyone could enter. That was the idea of the keys to the kingdom. It needed to have an orderly flow of people coming in so they could understand how to build upon that foundation. Once the people had entered, his call for that particular people was done. So to be effective, you could use that last key. The Gentiles had to be taught of Jesus. The Gentiles had to be saved by Jesus. And the church of Jesus had to accept them. All three of these things had to happen. Uh, let us look at Cornelius walking through the last door, open by Peter's call, and finishing Peter's call. Please stand in honor of his word as we read uh, Acts chapter 10, verses uh, 34 to 48. This is continuing from last week. Starting in Acts chapter 10, verse 34, we read this. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, of the truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. The word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. That word I say ye you know, which was published throughout all Judea, and began from Galilee, after the baptism which John preached. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed by the, of the devil. For God was with him. And we are witnesses of all things which he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hanged on a tree. Him God raised up the third day and showed him openly, not to all people, but unto witnesses chosen before of God, even to us who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of the quick and the dead. To him give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, 
because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then answered Peter, Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then prayed they him to tarry certain days. Heavenly Father, we look at your word, and we're thankful that you are a God of all people. You are a God open to all people, willing that all will come into your church to be taught of you, to receive salvation of you through the blood of Jesus Christ shed on the cross for the remission of sins. And Lord, let us remember that today. Let us go out and seek people who will come to your church, will come to your cross, will receive the gift of salvation, and join us in the battle in these last days to present your uh, light to a very dark world. We're thankful, Lord, that we as Gentiles uh, can come into your church. Salvation is of the Jews, and you use them to establish the foundation that we now build upon. And Lord, I pray that we uh, give you praise, honor, and glory, and we'll accomplish your call in these days as you use us. And we ask all of your precious sons your name. Amen. 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 And thank you. May be seated. Again, we continue uh, from last week showing that God is not a respecter of person. He judges the heart, declaring that heart, right, uh, that heart righteous if they accept the blood of Christ for the remission of sins, repenting of their own sins, and allowing him to cleanse the heart. We can't do it. Only Jesus Christ can. And as what Peter was teaching Cornelius. And yet salvation is of the Jews according to uh, John 4.22. God establishing a people learning of God through the law realizing that the law cannot justify any. The purpose of the law. The law establishing the need of a Savior in order to fulfill that law. Christ coming to provide grace by his blood, fulfilling that law forevermore. Peter builds on the truth of the law, showing the death, burial, and resurrection of the Jewish Messiah will save Cornelius and then all Gentiles. Romans 10, 12 telling us, For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. As Cornelius called, sending uh, for Peter by the angel. We see with Cornelius the common path of salvation. It's open to all. Everyone uh, today can have that same salvation in the same way. And we see it in three different ways as we see with Cornelius. First of all, by preaching, then by the saving, and finally, by the accepting. So preaching. Peter now starts a sermon to open a door as he did at Pentecost. Angels called both to come together. But notice the angel did not reveal the truth. Now, if you have an angel come in and start talking from God, do you think you might listen to that angel? You might accept what that angel says? That angel didn't do it. That angel told Cornelius to go for Peter. Why? Angels are not the one to preach the gospel. He calls us to preach the gospel. And that's what he showed uh, through this uh, scenario here. Now, God's preparations for effectiveness was made. The angel showed to Cornelius, who sent for Peter. Peter receives the vision. Since he receives the vision, he then goes to see Cornelius. Now, look at the preparation God gave. Think of the power Peter had with his words because of all this happened. When, if, you're, uh, if you're working with someone and you've been called to present the gospel, God has prepared the way, just like he did here. So God calls us and uses us to witness his truth. Building his church by preparing his warriors for different battlefields. Romans 10, 14. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Our sword is his word to witness uh, Christ in allowing him to change the heart as his words work through us. As a joint heir, we share in his call to see souls saved. As he is our captain, we obey and do the work he calls us to. But John 15, 5 reminds us that he is the vine. And without his word working through us, we can do nothing. Yes, fruit is produced on the branches. He calls us to produce his fruit. He calls us to present it. And we see the fruit by souls saved. But without the, him working through us with the vine, we can accomplish nothing and our branch will be saved. <coughs> And Romans uh, 10, 17 reminds us, uh, as we are called to witness for him, so that faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. The Gentiles did not have the truth of the law. They didn't understand the truth of the law. 
Peter tells Cornelius, you must fear him and do righteousness. Cornelius had done good works. Talks about his alms. Talks about his praying. He had done good works. There's no question about it. But not through Christ. He now finds out uh, the truth of James 2.17, reminding us that faith without works is dead. But Cornelius, being not yet saved, was still dead to good works, uh, as his branch was not connected to the mind of Christ. Peter was coming to allow that branch to be connected, to allow those good works, to glorify God, to make it so that Cornelius could receive the reward of God and salvation there. And Peter expounds on Christ to bring his righteousness to his audience. Now, Cornelius had no doubt heard of Jesus. He talks about that in the, in the word, uh, scriptures today. But Peter shows he is to teach the Son of God by the Word of God given to the people of God that will witness that he is the Son of God. He preached peace by Christ, who is Lord of all, the Messiah anointed by God to bring salvation to all people. As Luke 4.43 says, And he, Jesus, said unto him, I must preach the kingdom of God to other cities also, for therefore am I sent. So Jesus was anointed with power, the power of God by the Spirit of God, proving his Messiahship, doing good, preaching the good news, defeating Satan, and providing uh, uh, prophecies, provide, uh, fulfilled prophecies by his miracles. He fed 5,000. He fed 4,000. He healed many, even raising some from the dead. Dead, buried, and resurrection on the third day uh, to defeat death, fulfilling prophecy to show his truth. John 5.39 tells us, Jesus saying, Search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which, uh, uh, which uh, testify of me. So, to ensure that Cornelius could find Jesus guilty of being the Messiah, he talks to the eyewitnesses uh, to the resurrection. Anyone who's looked at any kind of uh, trial knows that eyewitnesses are critical. If you have eyewitnesses, your case is much stronger. So now, Peter is showing the witness of the fact that Jesus is Messiah. He talks about the eyewitnesses, seeing his miracles. They ran from him at his crucifixion. Now, they ran from his crucifixion. They were hiding. And yet all were willing to die for him after that. And they showed their power. They showed their bravery. They showed the willingness to stand for Christ afterward. The angel told uh, Cornelius to seek Peter. God's perfect plan was working perfectly. So, coming there, Peter tells him, not only did we see the resurrection, we died with him. We saw his body. We, we felt him. He had an actual body. And he was resurrected from the dead. Only an eyewitness could say that. So, he's risen from the dead. He's got a body. We can feel him. We can eat with him. The prophets predicted this. The apostles now witnessed it. And, seeing the eyewitnesses, Cornelius could not believe it. He could find Jesus guilty of being the Messiah by trial. So, think of the power Peter had as an eyewitness. The angel has called Peter to come talk to Cornelius. Cornelius was called to send for Peter. Now Peter tells him, I have seen the Messiah. Okay, the angel said that. He's called both of us, and Peter's given me an eyewitness account. What is there that I can possibly doubt? We see the, the uh, field being prepared for that seed. This came as Peter uh, was with many others at his ascension. Turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 8. So 1 Corinthians chapter 15, starting in verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I, had, which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and he rose again, and that he rose again on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve, after that, he was seen of about 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. After that, he was seen of James, then of all the apostles, and last of all, he was seen of me also, as of one born out of due time. Peter's preaching by God's call very effectively. 
we see all the witnesses to the fact that Jesus Christ has rose from the dead. But in all this, Peter worked hard to prepare uh, the proper scripture. He used time to prepare a sermon that would show uh, Cornelius the truth. But now God shows it is he, not Peter, who saves, even though Peter has to be obedient to bring the word. So we look at saving. Peter has a very detailed, rehearsed sermon he is presenting to um, provide salvation for Cornelius. You know what? We see here, he never got to finish it. While he's delivering God's truth by God's word, God responded by giving the Holy Ghost to the faithful. Uh, Cornelius and other Gentiles started speaking in tongues. They started prophesying. They did things saying that, Peter, your, your job's done. God is now taking over, is what he was saying. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Peter's obedience presented Cornelius the word of God, but it was not Peter's delivery uh, that saved them. It was the word obediently delivered. The vine of Christ produced the fruit on Peter's branch in Christ's, but not Peter's timing. Now, a similar thing happened on July 8th, 1741 in Enfield, Connecticut. Jonathan Edwards came in. He was called by the pastor there to uh, preach a sermon to what the pastor said was a dead congregation. He didn't think anybody was saved in this congregation at all. Could, could Jonathan Edwards do anything? He came in and he preached, and there's in the hands of an angry God. Just like Peter, he never got to finish. As he was preaching a very specific, very hard sermon about the need to repent, otherwise you'll be sent to hell, all of a sudden people start screaming. What must I do to be saved? They were holding on to the pews, afraid they were going to be swept to hell right then. God sent his spirit, and they all received the, the salvation that day through his word. That is how God can operate. It wasn't Jonathan that was uh, great words. In fact, he was obedient to bring those words to a people. And when he did, God moved. And Jonathan Edward gave God the credit. He didn't take it himself. In both Caesarea and Enfield, God showed salvation was of God in response to obedient delivery by his warriors. In Enfield, there was a mass repentance of people crying out to God in repentance for their sins. In Caesarea, astonished Jews see Gentiles magnifying God, speaking in tongues as they were blessed by God. Now, tongues were a sign to faithful Jews showing it was the word of God. Since tongues were a sign for the Jews, the Gentiles started speaking in tongues. The Jews knew that they were now accepted by God. God used it for a very specific reason. Peter asked now, by this proof, can any deny these baptism? Seeing immediate response based on the faithful proof, they were baptized. Similar to the Ethiopian Jews. Turn back to Acts chapter 8. Uh, verses, eight, uh, verses uh, 36 to 37. This is after Philip was called from the Samaritan uh, revival, where he went to when he went to Gaza, which is desert, to reach one Ethiopian uh, eunuch. Now look what happened in Acts chapter 8, verses 36 to 37. And as they went their way, they came unto a certain water. And the eunuch said, See, here's water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. At that point, they went down to the water and they got baptized. So, that was exactly what Peter said. We have witnessed that these have been accepted by God. What doth hinder them now from being baptized? Jews believe, uh, the Jews believe uh, John eleven twenty five. 25. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believed in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. The Jews felt it was a Jewish God uh, working through them. But now they see God's a God of all people. Gentiles can be saved. They were astonished. They were shocked. This was beyond their uh, realm of understanding. God had to deliver this this way to make it so that they could see that salvation had come to the Jews. Uh, excuse, excuse me, the Gentiles. They see the truth of our Romans 10-11. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. The Gentiles are not ashamed of the Jewish God and listen to a conquered Jew talk about their God and they believe in that holy God. The Jews of Peter would be used to verify his account just as Barnabas verified Saul as Paul after his road to Damascus experience. So now, we have the Jews have been accepted. That door has been opened. That was Pentecost. The Samaritans, uh, by their uh, revival with Philip, have been accepted. 
Peter opened that door. Now finally, the Gentiles went in. This is a strange door. Jews are not used to this. So they had to be taught to accept the Gentiles into the church. So let's look at uh, how that happened. Acts uh, chapter 11, verses 1 through 18. And the apostles and brethren that were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. And when Peter was come up to Jerusalem, they that were under circumcision contended with him, saying, Thou went us in to men uncircumcised, and did, did us eat with them? But Peter rehearsed the matter from the beginning, and expounded it by order unto them, saying, I was in the city of Joppa praying, and, a tran and in a trance I saw a vision. A certain vessel descended, as it had been a great sheet, let down from heaven by four corners, and it came even to me, upon the which, when I had fastened, my eye, uh, fastened mine eyes, I considered and saw a four-footed beast of the earth, and wild beasts, and creeping things, and fowls of the air. And I heard a voice saying unto me, Arise, Peter, slay and eat. But I said, Not so, Lord, for nothing common or unclean hath at any time entered into my mouth. But the voice answered me again from heaven, What God hath cleansed, that call not uh, that call not thou common. And this was done three times. And all were drawn up again into heaven. And behold, immediately there were three men already come unto the house I, where, I, where I was, sent from Caesarea unto me. And the Spirit bade me go with them, nothing doubting. Moreover, these six brethren accompanied me, and we entered into the man's house. And he showed us how he had seen an angel in his house, which stood and said unto him, Send men to Joppa, and call for Simon, whose surname is Peter, who shall tell thee words, whereby thou and all thy house shall be saved. And as I began to speak, the Holy Ghost fell on them, as on us at the beginning. Then remembered I the word of the Lord, how that he said, John indeed baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. For as much then as God gave them the like gift as he did unto us who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, what was I that I could withstand God? When they heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God, saying, Then have God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. Now understand, Peter's coming to talk to other Jews. They've heard about this uh, thing with him, with him talking to Gentiles. The Jews truly hated Gentiles. And the law did say that they should be a separate people from Gentiles. Gentiles could only be accepted if they became proselyte Jews. The reaction of the Jews to Peter would be expected. Uh, now, most commentators say this is an example of Jewish prejudice. This is an example of Jews wanting to hold back Gentiles, of wanting to keep them down. So I ask you, were they 100% wrong? Peter's coming back with a completely different uh, situation than they were used to. He did seem to disobey scriptures. They knew the scriptures. They were to remain a separate people from Gentiles, and here's Peter going in and talking to their house. They may have been too harsh. They may have shown their bias. But seeming heresy is never wrong to study and challenge, which is, to a certain extent, what they were doing. We are called to test the spirits. 1 John 4, 1 tells us, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. The Jews challenging Peter did just this, even if they did not understand it. To their credit, they did let Peter speak. They didn't try to stone him right now. They let him speak. Peter did not attack their questions. If you notice, he answered calmly. He did not feel insulted. Why? The questions, if harsh, were valid. Peter had the exact same questions at the very beginning until he received the training from God. Peter calmly told him what had happened by the Spirit's lead. Even more, he had Jewish witnesses with him that saw the same thing. Now, Peter is the lead apostle. He's the one considered to be the head. So, pride could have made it so he would, might have faced these attacks with stronger attacks right back at him. But Proverbs 15, 1 tells us, A soft answer turneth away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. He had no grievous words for him. He knew their questions probably before he came. Probably the Spirit led him to him. But understanding Jewish law, 
understanding their practices, they were questions, if harsh, were still reasonable. So his words were called giving a factual account. Look at the results. Uh, the Jews hated Peter's words. The Jews considered the evidence. As they considered the evidence, listened to all the Jews that were there, seeing the eyewitnesses, they understood that God had accepted the Gentiles and they praised God for it. A good example for us. Don't get into arguments. Calling answer things from his word. Our words in these dark days of hate should match Peter's calm words of love and light. The world lives in, in a world of darkness. There's no question about it. We serve the light of the world. They hate even each other. We are to love even our enemies. We desire to glorify God more than winning an argument. Acts 13, 47 tells us this. For so hath the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set thee to be a light of the Gentiles, that thou shouldest be for salvation under the ends of the earth. That's still our job. It's no different. It's no different from Peter trying to seek the Cornelius saved. We're to try to see the sinners today saved to come to God. Most of the Jews, most of the world did not. Most of the people today will not. But if God places someone in, the, in your area, calls you to witness to someone, you should be willing to see that person, no matter what you think of them. Meet sinners with loving, direct, truthful answers, tailored to the ability of people to receive the truth by their background and knowledge. As we see with Cornelius, God will move and save a lost individual in his time for his glory. If they reject us, if they reject what you're giving them, they're rejecting God, not you. So looking at all this, seeing Peter using the very last key, fulfilling his call of opening the doors, uh, making it so that all people can come in and worship God as the people they are. Gentiles can serve as Gentiles. You know, I love bacon. I can eat bacon because I'm a Gentile. If we had to be a Jew, I wouldn't be able to eat bacon. Boy, that'd be a bad religion, wouldn't it? <laughs> so, we see here in Peter's call, having the keys of the kingdom, uh, God's will, God's call, and man's obedience, and man's response to the obedience, all at the same time. Jesus gave Peter the keys to provide an orderly flow of people into his church. Jews had God's leading to understand God's Messiah. They understood the law. They understood the Old Testament. Now, once they're established, Samaritans uh, were her heretical uh, people. But they did understand the law. They tried to follow the law, even by the wrong temple. So, it was easier to bring them in. So we have Jews understanding uh, the path to the Messiah. We have now Samaritans coming in, corrected of their errors, understanding the law, but not the Gentiles. Gentiles are tough. They have absolutely no background at all. They needed the foundation of the church before they could be brought in. So that's what God was doing. He was bringing an orderly flow of people into his church to build on his foundation, that it could be strong. God's timing uh, needed an established church and a proper man to have the Gentiles ready to believe. God's will matched God's call, and Cornelius had proven to be the man the door to the Gentiles would be opened to. Now, being a Gentile, Peter also had to be prepared to use his sword in very unfamiliar areas, which he did. God gave him the uh, sheep with the unclean animals in response to his prayer. His prayer allowing God to work through him and give him understanding. He preached to Cornelius, who's believing God's word brought God's salvation. Again, it wasn't Peter's, uh, Peter speaking, it was Peter's obedience to bring God's word to him. If you, want to, if you want to witness to someone, don't say what you think. Don't talk about uh, the Fox News, what's on the Fox News. Bring the truth of his word and let God work on the heart. Our obedience brings his word through us as, uh, as he allows us to produce our fruit by his power. Let's continue in God's ultimate call to bring his word to all nations, baptizing in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. If the Spirit calls you to bring his word to an unbeliever, know the Spirit's already prepared the soil. It's ready for you to come in. He's done what needs to be done to accomplish his call in that person's life. Now, Think you're absolutely unable to do it? I don't. I can't bring the words. Be like Moses. I am uh, weak in speech. If God's called you, you can do it. He's going to uh, give you the words to speak. Now bring His truth. Answer sinners' questions in love as you preach the truth to His gospel. God may gloriously say it before you can even finish a sentence, as He did with Cornelius, as He did in Enfield. God may use your words to soften a heart that someone else may then come later 
and lead them to Christ. Or God may have uh, you thoroughly rejected as you bring forth his truth, and he can then say that uh, he, can, he cannot say that no one told me. Whatever it is, your labors are not in vain. God has used you to accomplish his call in that person's life. These end times, you may find yourself to be called into unfamiliar territory, just as Peter was in a Gentile city. You know, we look at that, we have the value of hindsight. Peter was sitting there. He wanted nothing to do with doing anything with a Gentile because the law said, I cannot do this. And he had the bias of his time. Gentiles are dogs. God was not going to accept the Gentile. They had to become Jews. Well, God turned him around. God used him to come to very unfamiliar territory. God may call you to do the same thing. If you are called to unfamiliar territory, sharpen your sword by reading his word. Sharpen your sword by praying to him for wisdom and guidance and go do what God calls you to do. Obey my God be God, bringing his salvation or his judgment in his perfect time. Lovingly yield your sword to be used his way and you will find yourself warring a good warfare. But as we get ready to pray, we're going to sing, Jesus said that whosoever will, uh, in uh, hymn uh, 333. It's exactly what God showed Peter. Now, I'm allowing Cornelius in. I'm allowing all those dogs to come into our church to serve as Gentiles. That was the amazing thing. I can eat bacon. Cornelius could eat bacon. He can come to the church and do it. The Jews didn't do that yet. Quite frankly, they may never have done it. That's up to them. That's Romans 14 and stuff. That we're not the whole thing is uh, make sure that you're able to talk to people wherever they're at. So as we uh, get ready to sing Whosoever Will, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Thank you, first of all, that he's allowed us to come through that door and serve him in his church. Uh, and thank him that he uses us to bring other people into those same doors. You know, to a certain extent, we have the keys of the kingdom. Not in the same way. The door's open. They can come in. But someone has to show him that door. And he uses us to show him that door. So let us uh, let us thank God that he uses us and then give us the power and the wisdom to do exactly that to accomplish his call in these end times. And then we'll say, and Jesus uh, said, whosoever will, and be done. Let's go to Lord prayer. Heavenly Father, I'm so thankful I stand, uh, stand before you a sinner. A sinner saved by the mercy and grace of Jesus Christ. A sinner saved as Jesus Christ came to walk the earth, to reveal God to man. To be put on the cross and shed his blood. And by his shed blood, my faith in that shed blood for the remission of sins, my sins are covered. And that is true, not because I'm so great, not because I'm so wonderful, not because there's any value in me at all. There isn't. I'm a sinner saved by grace only. But it's available to every single person here, and every single person who's done the same thing has that same mercy and same grace. And Lord, we thank you for that. We thank you that uh, hell has been removed from our future. We're thankful that we will be with you forevermore, serving you uh, in spirit and truth in the heaven that you provide for us. And Lord, I pray that we will show that same joy to others. We will bring that truth to modern-day Cornelius, who are ready for salvation but aren't there yet. Use us in your great and mighty path, Lord. Use us to provide your great commission. Use us to bring your truth to hearts ready to receive it, that then you may gloriously save them. And Lord, I pray that you give us um, the wisdom in these times, facing whatever trials we face, showing people the love of Christ to a, people, to a hateful world that they may respond. And Lord, we're thankful for everything you do for us. We're thankful for any fruit you produce through us. And let us uh, present it back to you at the Bema Seat. And look forward to those days where you'll say, well done, good and faithful servant, and it all the joy of the Lord. But for now, Lord, we know our labors are not done, and we know our labors are not in vain if we serve you and accomplish your call. And Lord, help us to work with warfare. We ask you in precious sons your name. Amen. Amen. And with that, let's turn to uh, hymn 333 and sing, Jesus said, whosoever will. Please do stand as we prepare to sing hymn number 333. 
Jesus said that whosoever will, and we're on our own on this one. There is no accompaniment, <laughs> so we'll do this on acapella. So uh, just follow along with me. I'll just give us four counts, and we'll come right in on it. We're going to do it two times through. One, two, here we go. Jesus said that whosoever will, whosoever will, whosoever will. Jesus said that whosoever will, whosoever will may come. I'm so glad that he included me, he included me. Whosoever will may come. Jesus said that whosoever will, whosoever will, whosoever will. Jesus said that whosoever will, whosoever will may come. I'm so glad that he included me. He included me. He included me, I'm so glad that he included me when Jesus said that whosoever will become. Amen. Praise God. <laughs> so in this family of whosoever's, if there's anybody who's not a whosoever yet, you see me after the service, and I will show you from his word exactly how he can save you. Amen. You are dismissed.